I am glad to introduce our good friend, Paul Henrik P. Goho Cruz. Paul is a graduate of Bachelor of Science in Biology from the Central Luzon State University in Nueva Ecija. And he took his Master's of Science in Wildlife Studies, uh, minoring in Herpetology from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños here in Laguna. He was a DOST, AST, HRDP, NSC scholar and a recipient of the Ruford Small Grants for Nature Conservation uh, based in the UK and the IDEA Wild Equipment Grant, which is based uh, in the US. He is currently working as an instructor at the Department of Biological Sciences, Central Luzon State University, where he teaches systematics, taxonomy, evolutionary biology, ecology, and biodiversity conservation. He has been involved in numerous biodiversity surveys conducted throughout Luzon, and his uh, research interest includes wildlife biology, herpetology, uh, distribution, ecology and diversity, as well as biogeography and bioacoustics. Again, friends, let us all welcome Paul Hendrik Goho Cruz. Paul? Okay, so again, good morning, everyone. Uh, so I will be presenting uh, the result of our study on the biodiversity, specifically the diversity of vertebrates, vertebrate fauna in a highly variable and ever-changing landscape. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, this will be perhaps the first time that a study on the agroecosystem will be presented. Because usually, ang nape-present sa um, MNH uh, Biodiversity Seminar Series will be studies focused on natural uh, ecosystem, like say, for example, forest, mangrove ecosystem, um, seagrass, or marine habitats. So um, I think uh, this will be the yeah, first time na the focus will be on a habitat which is usually modified or heavily modified by human activity. So the flow of the talk or the organization of the presentation will include an introduction. So uh, just a brief introduction on, of what is an agroecosystem, then the relationship between agroecosystems and biodiversity. And of course, uh, since this will be focused on CLSU's vertebrate fauna, so I'll be also introducing the, uh, the highly variable and ever-changing landscape of CLSU which is my home university or my home institution. Then, uh, of course, the bulk of my presentation will be on the vertebrate fauna of CLSU, both um, based on past records and present records, and some information related to the future of agroecosystems, specifically threats and conservations and filling in the gaps, so um, recommendations for further studies. So as a short background, uh, this is actually the result of our study entitled Biodiversity Assessment Towards Potential Sustainable Ecotourism Development in Central Luzon State University. So the idea of the project was actually to um, generate um, a list of species found in CLSU and how we can um, use this as an information to help us develop an, eco um, an ecotourism activity centered on CLSU. So what we want to show is to highlight ano yung mga species na meron sa CLSU and then what activities can be done or as a way to highlight this biodiversity. Um, this project was funded by the University Academic Research Council and I'm a part of, I am the study leader of the project, but our project leader is Ma'am Diane Sheila Castillo of the Department of Environmental Science, which is also a wildlife biology graduate of UPLB. So nauna siya sa akin ng one year, if I'm not mistaken. So I'll be presenting yung result or part of the result of our study. So for the study, we, which we conducted around 2018 and 2019, so prior to the COVID restriction, so buti umabot bago yung lockdown, yung ECQ. 
So standard sampling for vertebrae fauna includes uh, for herpetofauna would be night sampling and transect walks. So yun. Uh, usually we do our survey uh, after the class kasi yun yung available. So sakto, night time, enough time to sample for the herpetofauna which includes your amphibians and your reptiles. For bird uh, assessment, we do uh, we did transect walks as well as mist netting, which are uh, standard protocols for bird assessment. So the tangal retrieval. Then uh, also for mammals, we did uh, mist netting as well as cage trapping. So more or less the methods used for. Um, surveying vertebrate fauna in agroecosystem is pretty much or more or less similar to those methods used to, uh, in the assessment of vertebrate fauna in forest habitats, mangrove ecosystems, and the like. So halos walang pinagkaiba, magkaiba lang siya when it comes to, uh, for example, pagsaset up ng setting, uh, pagsaset up, saka yung location kung saan kami nagsaset up. Because in agroecosystem, you can also set up in areas, usually, for example, yung mga infrastructure, which definitely absent, sa, for example, sa forest. So as an introduction, uh, let us first define what is an agroecosystem. So agroecosystem, as the name implies, is an agroecosystem associated with agriculture. So uh, uh, agro, uh, agricultural activity. This includes yung not only yung pagpatanim ng rice, but also includes um, other activities related to agriculture like uh, aquaculture. For example, kung may naka-incorporate na fish fund, uh, fish fund doon sa rice field. Uh, this also includes yung pagpapalaki ng mga livestock like chicken, ducks, or cows, or carabao. So those activities which are related to agriculture. Those area na dedicated for agricultural activity are known as agroecosystem. And since this area are dedicated for agricultural activities, you could expect that this area are highly modified by human activities, especially those areas dedicated for planting crops. They are highly variable habitats because um, if you look at the structure of the habitat structure of an agroecosystem, you can see a uh, great variation dun sa habitat type, in particular yung um, vegetation cover. So sa isang area ng agroecosystem, you can find a rice field and then katabi niya merong agroforest, then katabi niya merong grassland, then maybe in some areas merong naka-incorporate na aquatic habitat. So it is highly variable. And at the same time, it is ever-changing. Ever-changing in a sense that, yun nga, since siya ay highly modified by human activities, so yung habitat structure changes season by season according to the planting season or kung ano mang agricultural activity yun nagaganap doon sa area. So lagi siyang nababago. Highly variable and ever-changing. Uh, in some literature, like for example, Odum in 1997 or Fernando in 1996, they considered irrigated agroecosystems. So these are agroecosystems usually planted with rice na merong irrigation system. Ibig sabihin may patubig. So they may be considered as freshwater marsh with cultivated grass. So in this case, the cultivated grass refers to rice. Or as agronomically managed marshes. So those areas manage for agro, uh, agricultural activities. Okay. So an agroecosystem is typically composed of several uh, uh, components. Usually the first and the one we usually incorporate with agroecosystem is yung crop plants. So this is the specific area planted with crops. Um, this includes rice in the case of Central Luzon. So primary product na agricultural product ng Central Luzon is yung um, rice. Although there are other uh, 
cultivated crops na tinatanim. Let's say, for example, sa tardak, usually corn. Uh, sa Pampanga, you have sugar cane. So kapag sinabi natin agroecosystem, hindi lang po about rice. So it includes other agricultural crops. Uh, there are also areas planted with vegetable and the likes. Then in some instances, especially those areas na merong irrigation or near freshwater habitats, let's say, for example, river, meron dyan mga associated aquatic habitats. These aquatic habitats may include both um, yung mga non-flowing bodies of water, let's say, for example, yung mga pond, and those which are flowing, like, say, um, river, uh, irrigation canals, and ponds. These aquatic habitats can also be permanent. So, throughout the year, nandun siya. Or it can be intermittent. Ibig sabihin, there are times na meron siya, may times na wala. Usually coinciding with the um, dry and wet season in an area. Uh, for example, then sa mga fish pond, may time niyan na dry, especially kapag hinarvest na yung mga uh, fish. And usually kapag yung spawning season, uh, napupuno ng tubig. Aside from these two habitats present in an agroecosystem, kasama rin sa agroecosystem yung human habitations and infrastructure. So usually, di ba, kapag nagpupunta tayo sa mga bukid, uh, nakipapansin nyo meron ng mga nakalagay na kubo, meron din mga uh, uh, infrastructure, mga buildings, facilities, usually associated with agriculture. Uh, kasama din dyan yung mga roads, which are usually found bisecting or traversing agroecosystem. And then at the same time, with, uh, associated with agroecosystems are the orchards. So these are area planted with fruiting or timber trees. So um, ito yung mga tinataniman ng prutas. Uh, in the case of uh, Nueva Ecija, karamihan dyan, mango. Uh, and then agroforest. So these are areas planted intentionally or unintentionally with shrub or tree. So ibig sabihin, ito yung mga lugar uh, sa tabi or pagitan ng mga palaya na meron mga puno or shrub. Uh, either tinanim to ng mga farmers or hindi. So yun yung agroforest. So these are the different typical component of an agroecosystem. When it comes to um, changes, so sabi ko nga kanina, ever-changing ang agroecosystem. Usually, it cycles from a uh, habitat covered with vegetation, especially in the case of rice, although applicable din siya sa corn sa kasa um, sugar cane. So, may time na siya ay covered with vegetation, usually yung mga planted crop as well as yung associated plants. And there are times na more or less devoid siya of vegetation. Usually, this seasonal variation in cover is related to the planting season. And yung planting season naman is dictated din ng uh, season. Uh, kung dry season siya or wet season, usually plant, uh, crops are planted during the rainy season para may available water. Then pagdating ng drier months, yung tagtuyot, sakto namang harvesting season. So usually in agroecosystem, kapag hinarvest yung primary crop, usually dyan, uh, nade-devoid ng vegetation. So, totally nawawala yung cover. So, pabago-bago siya, seasonal changes in terms of vegetation cover as dictated by the planting season. So, when it comes to agro-systems, agro-ecosystems, and biodiversity, uh, ang component diversity ng agro-ecosystem are composed ng dalawa, according to Vardemir et al., 2012. So this includes your plant diversity. So plant, ibig sabihin, ito yung nakaplano. For example, uh, yung mga rice, yung corn, uh, yung sugar cane. So ito yung kasi nakaplanong itanim. So ito yung plant diversity. So in a agricultural land, for example, pwedeng yung farmer magtanim siya ng multiple types of crop. So kung gusto niya maglagay din ng uh, vegetable plots, so, pwede. So, ito yung plant diversity. Kasama rin dito yung mga domesticated animals. Like, for example, yung mga goat, cattle. So, these are all plants. Ibig sabihin, this is dictated by the farmers themselves. Kung ano yung itatanim, saka kung anong yung 
domesticated animal na nandoon. And then at the same time, an agrobiodiversity is composed also of associated diversity. So these are plants or animals which are or may be already in the area prior to the area being an agricultural land. So matagal na nandun yung uh, plant or animal na ito. Or these are plants or animals which takes advantage of the um, agroecosystem. So pwede silang permanent resident ng agroecosystem or they can be transient. So for example, yung mga migratory birds. So those are associated diversity. So they take advantage of the resources within the agroecosystem. So these two are the component of your uh, agrobiodiversity, those which are plant and those which are associated. So these are examples of uh, associated fauna found in your typical agroecosystem. You have your uh, toads, like the invasive rhinella marina, the snakes, which are likely in the area even before yung area is convert into agricultural land. So they are permanent resident of agricultural lands. The same time you have migratory birds like egrets, which take advantage of the resources in an agroecosystem. So when it comes to uh, being an agroecosystem, uh, CLSU is what we may consider as a model agroecosystem. So pasok siya doon sa uh, very highly variable yung habitat types. At the same time, there is um, seasonal changes in uh, the physical characteristic of each habitat types. So as a background, CLSU was established in 1907 as an institution focused on agriculture. So almost more than 100 years in CLSU and its primary focus talaga is agriculture. Although we are now offering um, other specializations and degree. Total land area of the main campus is 658 hectares. We also have uh, additional land, usually kung saan nandun yung mga karabaw doon sa may karanglan, Nueva Ecija. So, mas malaki yun, 1,000 hectares. Uh, it's not only agricultural land, but also agroforestry or forestry land. But I'll be presenting yung sa main campus. So, it is a recognized cultural property of the Philippines owing to its uh, long history of existence and usually listed as one of the most beautiful university in the Philippines together with uh, UP, UPLB. So here's the um, Google Earth imagery of the whole of CLSU plus yung mga associated barangays. So ito yung main campus ng university. This one. So yun yung mga infrastructure which includes your colleges, dormitories, and the likes. And as you can see, there is it is surrounded by a vast um, land dedicated for um, planting rice. Paramihan dyan rice. Usually rice yung nakatanin. Although there are some areas dedicated for planting of other habitat, uh, of other plants. For example, in this area here, it is a College of Agriculture ng University. So it's planted with ornamental plants. Usually mga flowering plants. Uh, we also have yung tinatawag na sawmill. This one. This is planted with timber trees. So usually mahogan the likes. Uh, within the main campus, meron ding areas dedicated for conservation of uh, native endemic trees uh, sa taas. Yung tinatawag naming lingap kalikasan. So para siyang uh, mini bagyo. Kasi dati daw uh, binibisita siya ng mga superintendents, American superintendents, on their way back galing Baguio. So, dyan. Saka there, we also have one here. So, ito naman yung Parks and Wildlife Center. And then, interspersed would be areas of uh, infrastructure. And then, uh, we also have aquatic habitats here. These are intermittent ponds. Uh, usually, meron dyan mga tilapia. So, dyan pinapalaki yung tilapia. 
So, minsan may tubig, minsan wala. And then, other fish ponds are here. So, College of Fisheries. So, just by looking at the physical layout of the university, we can see na uh, very variable yung habitat. Meron kang habitat na densely covered by trees and shrubs. Meron kang habitat na ang cover niya ay um, rice. You have aquatic habitats and as, as well as human habitations, which can also serve as habitats for certain uh, fauna. So here are some of the images I had taken of some of the sites sa CLSU. So ito yung uh, areas planted with rice. So ito ay uh, binhi pa lang. So actually parang um, second crop yata to. This one is first cropping. So yung unang tanim. Then, um, biodiversity corridors or green corridors. So those areas planted with uh, trees, primarily for the purpose of um, ornamentation as well as providing shade. So para hindi rin mainit. So um, animals take advantage of these green corridors to move from one area to another. So para nagiging pathway nila yan from one area to another. And those we also have areas dedicated for agroforestry, so planted with trees. Uh, this one is in the Parks and Wildlife Center. These two are in the, what we call Lingap Kalikasan. So para siyang ano, uh, mini, po, uh, mini forest, although hindi siya kasing diverse ng iyong uh, typical secondary or primary forest. So yun yung mga, uh, some of the images I took while doing some survey in the university. So ito naman yung mga aquatic habitats. Uh, as you can see, there could be variation also when it comes to aquatic habitats. Meron ka mga aquatic habitats that are not covered by vegetation. So uh, open lang siya. And then you also have aquatic habitats covered with vegetation. In this case, uh, your water spinach or your kangkong. So, uh, and of course, vertebrate fauna like birds take advantage of this uh, differences in um, the structure of the habitat. So for the results, uh, basically pinaka-bulk ng um, results ng aming survey. So I also did some literature review of uh, available data from our department, uh, primarily mga undergraduate thesis looking into records of vertebrate fauna in the past. So the oldest one I found was uh, a survey of vertebrate fauna in 1996 by Aguada. This includes uh, vertebrate fauna from the fish to mammals. The next survey was two years after that, which was in 1998. Uh, again, another undergraduate thesis, which is on the survey of vertebrate fauna, but this time it excludes the fish. So, ang kasama lang is yung terrestrial fauna, which was by Ruma. Then, followed a year later by survey of chiropterans. And then, a year after that is survey of birds and anurans. And then here comes the big gap. So for the next 16 years, walang naganap na survey related to the, any of the vertebrate fauna of CLSU. Um, laki ng gap, 16 years. So after 2000, year 2000, 2016 na uli yung next survey of birds. Uh, so ang focus lang is birds. And then the next one is two years after that, which includes again, all the vertebrates, uh, excluding yung fish. Hindi namin sinama yung fish. Ito yung summary project namin. So 2018 to 2019 survey season. So if you will notice, ang laki ng gaps when it comes, for example, sa uh, reptiles. So the last, the most, uh, the oldest one is yung 1996 followed by 1998. And then reptiles were only resurveyed in 2018. 
So, ang laki nung gaps, uh, almost 20 year gaps when it comes to reptiles. As for the rest, more or less naman, um, malit tayo yung gaps when it comes to uh, survey. Uh, ideally, uh, kaya ako ito nilagay kasi I want to see kung ano yung variation or changes in species con uh, composition through time. So, meron bang nabagong, uh, meron ba nadagdag na records, meron bang nawalang species o hindi na may record ng species. But more or less, these are the ones I found na data available sa department level. So with regards to um, after collating the data from past records and our most recent records, so ito yung species account. So the number of species recorded throughout CLSU, the past and in the present. So this includes six species of frogs. Five species of lizards, which includes uh, uh, your geconid lizard, skinkid lizard, and as well as your varanid lizard. Eight species of snakes, and one species of soft shelled turtle. So, ito yung compo uh, recorded herpetofauna sa CLSU. With regards to avifauna or the birds, there are 52 species of uh, wild birds and six species of um, domesticated birds. Uh, these six species were included in the reports of Ruma uh, in 1998, sakayin sa 1996. So sinama kasi nila yung domesticated animals. But in our survey nitong 2018-2019, we focused on the uh, wild bird species. But uh, so, uh, based on the records, there are six domesticated species on CLSU. For mammals, uh, we have 11 species which are all domesticated uh, animals like your goat, cattle, dogs, cats, and the like. Of course, uh, those are domesticated, uh, domesticated animals na definitely plant diversity. For uh, non-volant mammals, which includes your rodents and the like, there are six species. And for the flying mammals, or the bats, that includes six species. So ito yung uh, mammalian component na CLSU. So uh, ano ang mga species yung na-record namin? Uh, for the herpetofauna or amphibians, we recorded uh, six species which includes your, uh, most of these are field frogs, uh, like your Pedgerbaria, your Hoplo, Batracus, your Hylarana, Kalula, Polypedates, and Rhinella. So based on uh, the yearly survey, so 1996 and 1998, dalawang species lang yung na-record. And then 2000, nadagdag yung Polypedates, yung And then 2018, so uh, we recorded six. Uh, I would just like to make it clear na it is possible that some of these species, although hindi na record noong 1996, 1998, or 2000, could be, um, baka hindi lang na-encounter ng researcher during that time. So possible na present na siya doon sa university or in the agroecosystem, nagkataon lang na hindi sila na tulista or na encounter during their sampling. With regards to uh, residency status, so 16% of those recorded um, amphibians are endemic. Actually, isa lang endemic, which is yung Pejorbaria bitigera. Yung Luzon uh, frog, field frog, which was recorded in 2018. And then 67% or roughly 4% are introduced species. So yung mga introduced species na yun, that includes your um, Chinese bullfrog, uh, your green tree frog, your painted frog, yung kung tawagin dito palakang baka kasi malakas yung ano yung huni niya, parang baka. Then of course your very common Rhinella marina. So yung um, common toad. Um, based on literature, yung Kalula pulka was recorded in around early 20, uh, year 2000. But first, ko siyang narinig sa CLSU around 2010. So from 2010 onwards, uh, it becomes a more dominant species. Sometimes mas madalas mo siyang maririnig or ma-encounter compared to Rhinella marina. 
especially during the rainy season. So there are instances na na-overcome or baka in the near future, mas maging dominant yung Kalula Pulpra, yung uh, painted toad. So those are the records for the um, amphibians. So from 2000 to 2018, merong malaking gap, 18-year gap sa survey on um, on amphibians, so species listing. So here are some of the um, species. Actually, ito para silang lahat. So yung anin. So the only endemic species is this one, the Luzon field frog. And the rest, uh, this is the native one, the common tree frog, and the rest are introduced species. So usually, itong uh, Chinese bullfrog is the one na nadadisect sa department kasi marami sa bukid. And it's known as a delicacy. Pinakain talaga siya. Especially here in Central Luzon. For the reptiles, so ito yung um, list of species of reptiles found in CLSU. So 2018. Paramihan ay na-record ng 2018. Although some species, let's say for example, yung Baranus marmoratus, which, which is yung common monitor wizard, was recorded only in 1998. The last time I saw a monitor lizard in CLSU was in 2011. Nung merong kasing incident nun na yung monitor lizard for some reason nakapasok dun sa isang um, building, sa college, sa isang college. So we were asked to capture the monitor lizard. So that was in 2011. And then by 2018, uh, wala na kami na record na monitor lizard. So, more or less, meron sa CLSU or the, sa agroecosystems associated with CLSU, although they are not that abundant. Hindi sila ganun karami. Uh, another notable one would be yung uh, Chinese softshell turtle, which is yung Pilodiscus sinensis, which is an introduced species. So, not recorded in 1996 and 1998. The first time it was reported was around the latter part of 2017 and 2018. Doon sa fish pond associated sa uh, college, of, uh, college of Fisheries. So merong nahuli doon. Compared doon sa abundance nila sa Pampanga, for example, uh, sa agroecosystem sa CLSU, hindi sila ganun ka-abundant. Medyo bihira pa silang makita. With regards to residency status, 50% of the species are endemic. So Philippine and then that means they are only found in um, the Philippines. So ito yung mga merong asterisk. Except for the Pelodiscus sinensis which is an invasive species, introduced invasive species. But the rest are endemic. And then some are um, native species. So among the uh, vertebrate fauna recorded in the agroecosystem, yung reptiles yung merong highest percentage of endemism. So it is surprising that we find uh, numerous endemic species of reptiles in agroecosystems because usually we think of endemic species associated with forests or those habitats which are more pristine. Ibig sabihin hindi masyadong nade-disturb ng humans. But we are surprised that we actually found several endemic species sa agroecosystem. So ito yung ilan sa mga picture of the uh, snakes we recorded in the agroecosystems. Uh, we have your paradise tree snake, common wolf snake, uh, bowie skillback, and the Philippine cobra, which is usually talaga marami dito sa central Luzon, no, uh, Philippine cobra. Uh, this one is, ito yung, actually, hinabol-habol to ng mga kasama na may student sa kala nila rat snake. So hinabol-habol nila. Ang nandun kasi ako sa kabilang side ng field eh, to, to do my sampling. So hinabol nila, uh, not knowing na siya ay uh, Philippine Cobra. So nung pinuntahan ko, kasi uh, inano nila eh, uh, kumuha nila ng stick, sabi ko, uh, I will... Kukuhain ko siya for better documentation kasi nakita ko lang yung tail so mukha siyang rat snake. Kasi usually nakukonfuse yung cobra sa yung rat snake. 
when I was about to uh, get, mahawakan ko na yung head niya. So doon ko nakita na, well, this is a Philippine Cobra. So for the safety of the students kasama namin. So sabi ko, picture nyo na lang and then uh, uh, we will let it go. So yun. So yun yung mga snakes na usually nakikita sa mga agro ecosystem. So they are more or less quite tolerant dun sa human activities. And they also take advantage of the different amphibian species na nandoon sa agro ecosystem. Usually mga frogs. Saka yung mga rodents na nandoon. So lizards, typical house lizards, as well as your skink. And then uh, this one was a photo taken by Ruma in 1998. So yung uh, monitor lizard na nakolekta nila doon sa agro ecosystem associated with CLS. So wala kasi yung picture ng 2011. The last time I saw a monitor lizard in CLS. Then avifauna, so these are the birds. So we have 52 wild birds recorded in the agroecosystems of CLSU from 1996 to 2018. The most extensive surveys were done in 2016 and 2018. Previous surveys, wala silang masyadong record because I think this is primarily due to uh, difficulty in sampling. So uh, I can't imagine kung gaano kahirap mag-sampling ng 1996 and 1998 when DSLR or those cameras na merong telephoto lens are not that common yet. So the most extensive was in 2016 and 2018. Kaya mas maraming records during this time. So with regards to um, residency status, medyo kukunti endemic species. So most of the species recorded are resident. So that means they are naturally occurring in the Philippines. And this also includes those migrant species na nag-establish na rin ng resident population. Then this is followed by migratory species. And then uh, introduced species, actually dalawa lang, ah, tatlo. And then your endemic species. So migratory species medyo marami because CLSU being more or less a wetland or a marshland. So nadadaanan siya na mga birds during their migratory season, usually around April and September yan, medyo maraming migratory birds yan, which also coincides with the time ng planting and harvesting season. So ito rin yung time na maraming available na tubig dun sa mga pan. So Philippines being part of the East Asian Flyway, so nadadaanan siya ng mga migratory birds and then these migratory birds take advantage of the agroecosystems throughout Central Luzon during their uh, migration. So uh, we are familiar doon sa Candaba Swamp, but also agroecosystems throughout Central Luzon, mga usually planted with uh, rice, usually nagiging pahingahan niya ng mga migratory birds. So napaka-importante ng agroecosystems of uh, Central Luzon as a uh, pit stop or stopover for these migratory birds during their migration. So with regards to habitat preference, 54 species are land birds. And then 46 species are water birds. Ah, of course, sorry, 46% are water birds. So these are usually birds that take advantage of the available water in the fish pond as well as in the irrigated rice fields during their migration. Then with regards to feeding yield, so more or less equal yung number ng those which are mixed feeders. That means they are either uh, granivore or carnivore or insectivore. Then carnivores accounts for 34% and 26% are insectivores. So ito yung uh, feeding yields ng mga birds be recorded from CLSC. Most of the carnivores are those which feed on fish like your kingfisher and your egrets and herons. So they take advantage of the fish na ini-spawn doon sa mga fish pond associated with agroecosystem. Um, some of the most notable um, observation was that of the Lunchura oryzivora or yung dating Pada oryzivora. Yung, um, so it was recorded in high abundance in 1996 and 1998 and until 2000. So marami siyang record. But by 2016, uh, 
parang ang, nakit, ang available na lang sa data is there are only two individuals observed during the 2016 survey. And in our 2018 survey, uh, wala kami na record Although from time to time, uh, the last time I think was in 20, last year, 2020, no nakakita ako ng um, Lonchura or Isibora, uh, hindi sila ganun kaabandan. Parang sa FLOC is tatlong individuals lang yung members. So from 1996 to 2018, bumababa yung abundance ng species na ito. As for the rest, more or less equal yung abundance nila. So ito tayo yung ibang species of birds we recorded. Uh, so here are images of your water birds. So these are uh, some of these are migratory species. And these are your land birds. Usually naka-perch dun sa mga plants as well as makikita mo rin sa uh, taking advantage of the insects na nandun sa mga infrastructure. Like for example, the uh, Philippine Pied Fantail are more or less uh, common dun sa mga area na maraming infrastructure. So, uh, kasi maraming insects. And then of course, associated with your agroecosystem is yung in introduced na Eurasian tree sparrow. Especially very abundant during the um, time na nakapag-harvest na ng rice tapos dinadry na yung rice sa mga roadside. So very big advantage nila yung available rice grains. Then we ha also have uh, si uh, red turtle dove, uh, primarily frugivorous, kumakain ng fruits. Then of course your brown shrike, your kingfisher, and your long-tailed shrike. So ito yung mga typical na nahuhuli namin uh, during sampling as well as during uh, transect walks. Uh, this is another um, record na it was only recorded in 1996 but never again. So hindi na siya na-record after 1996 yung Luzon Hawk Owl. So it was fortunate na na-record siya ni um, Aguada during her, in her study. So yung Linux Philippinensis. So it was only recorded in 1996 but it was not recorded ever since. So probably the local population had been extirpated or either moved to a different habitat. Or pwede rin siyang incidental recording or accidental recording. But in 2018, uh, wala na. Hindi namin siya na-record. Hindi namin na-observe. So for the mammals, so ito yung mga mammals na meron. We have a deer, bats, monkey, and rodents. So with regards to residency status, um, only uh, two are endemic. Uh, only one is endemic and, and most are resident species. So naturally occurring sa Philippines. Except for the introduced species of rodents. So yung mga daga na galing ng, uh, na introduced lang from other countries. So uh, notable observations. Oh, here are, here are the bats. So yung common set, yung Asian house bat, which is the most common uh, insect bat na meron sa CLSU, uh, sa agroecosystem, at least in the CLSU. And the most common fruit bat is yung uh, Sinopterus brachiotis, yung common short-nosed fruit bat. So this is locally abundant, especially during the summer season, kung kailan uh, nagsisimulang mag-bloom yung flowers ng mga fruiting trees, primarily mango, as well as guava and your um, cherry. So usually, common to kapag summer, marami sila kapag summer. And these two are, well, I think I can say na unique records sa CLSU because you will not expect to find um, deer and monkeys in an agro ecosystem, primarily in central Luzon. Maybe dun sa mga area na malapit sa primary forest but not in, um, in an area na totally flat dedicated for planting uh, agricultural crops. But definitely, these two species are uh, transitional. So probably for rehabilitation, kaya sila nakarating sa CLSU. So yung Philippine deer, recorded in 1996, and yung Philippine macaque, which is in 1996. So after that, uh, wala na. Uh, although hindi naka-indicate ko ano yung uh, nangyari sa kanila, 
doon sa study na naging kung saan sila recorded. So I, I'm not sure if they are released in the wild again once they were rehabilitated. So again, surprising na meron pala dati uh, at least transitional na na-record na nandun yung na meron Philippine deer sa Philippine makak doon sa uh, agroecosystem of CLRC. Ito siyempre nakakulong, hindi siya wild. Okay. So those are the uh, different vertebrate fauna of associated with the agroecosystem of CLSU. So from recorded from those areas planted with agricultural crops, those areas in uh, those aquatic habitats as well as in the agroforested area. So when it comes with seasonal variation in species composition and abundance, so I split yung um, season into two, yung dry season, which usually occurs around January to June, although uh, definitely, uh, most likely due to climate change, medyo, medyo na pushback na siya. Ngayon, um, July na, pero hindi pa ganun ka tagulan dito sa, at least in Central Luzon. And then, wet season usually around July or December. So when it comes to variation, in species composition and abundance. So for the amphibians, uh, you would expect talaga na mababa yung observation nila during the dry season, especially in agroecosystems, which in some instances totally nawawalan ng aquatic habitats, totally dry out. So kapag dry season talaga, napakababa ng abundance, except for some hardy species like for example yung Rhinella marina, yung common toad, uh, medyo hardy yan sa ano eh, dry season. So from time to time makakakita ka pa. But for the other species, mas mababa yung abundance nila. But come wet season, yan. Sobrang ingay na nila. Especially in an agroecosystem. Uh, Iba't ibang huni ng frogs yung marirecord mo or maririnig mo. Kasi so during this time, simula na silang mag-reproduce. Uh, As for the reptiles, uh, usually, mas mataas yung observation namin in terms of species presence as well as yung abundance during the dry season compared during the wet season. Um, I think the primary reason for this is during the dry season, mas madaling mag-sampling ng reptiles. Kasi at, during the dry season, mababa yung vegetation cover since tagtuyot, uh, those shrubs as well as yung mga agricultural crops nagda-dry out so mas madaling makita or ma-detect yung species. Compared during the wet season na uh, dense yung vegetation cover, kasi tag-ulan nun, so uusbong yung uh, mga plants. So mas difficult yung um, observation for the reptiles. So yung primary reason kung bakit mukhang mas kumbaga artificial yung pagtaas ng abundance and species diversity of reptiles. For the birds, more or less, um, you can record similarity in species composition in abundance during the dry and wet season. Although, mas bumababa yung number ng aquatic birds during the dry season, again, related to the availability of water, but those species which are not uh, really tied to aquatic habitats, like for example, yung mga uh, Progiborous, insectivorous, or other carnivorous birds. Usually, nandun sila, hindi sila nawawala. Present sila all year round. But come wet season, uh, dumarat, saka naman dumarating yung mga migratory birds. So, kaya more or less uh, equal yung number ng uh, birds during the dry season or the wet season. As for rodents, uh, almost equal because uh, during the dry season or during times na walang panim, yung mga palayan, rodents can take advantage of human habitation associated with this, uh, with the agroecosystem. So usually, ito na yung time na they move into human habitation o kaya dun sa mga greenery o kaya mga uh, seed, seed wall. So they take advantage of that, yung mga stored food. And then when the time comes na meron na uling planted rice, narating na ng planted rice yung maturity niya. So they move to the rice field to take advantage of the resources there. 
So more or less equal yung um, abundance and number of species ng rodents, whether dry season or wet season. As for the bats, specifically fruit bats, usually mas mababa yung record namin kapag wet season sa agro-ecosystem. Usually the uh, abundance is higher during the drier months, uh, especially around March, April, when ito yung season ng fruiting. So maraming fruiting trees, maraming bunga. So marami kami nahuhuling um, frugivorous bats. But during the uh, wet season, medyo mas mababa yung ano records. So these are uh, variation when it comes to species composition abundance in an agroecosystem. Okay. So the third part of my talk would be on threats and conservation. So ano yung mga threats na kinakaharap ng agroecosystems, not only in Central Luzon, but throughout um, the Philippines, for example, sa Cagayan Valley, which is also a, an area dedicated for uh, planting agricultural plants. So what's the future of agroecosystems, at least in the case of the Philippines? So this data comes from the Philippine Statistics Authority on the report on agriculture and fisheries from 1980 to 2012. So this is the total area holdings of farms in Central Luzon. So hindi ko sinamayin sa may other agricultural areas. May isama ko lang na data is Central Luzon. So you can see there was an increase between 1980 and 1991. This primarily coincides during... Uh, up, uh, during the time na in-implement yung Comprehensive Agrarian Reform Program. But from 1991 to 2012, based on the data, it is clear that the area dedicated for agroecosystems as well as those habitats associated with agroecosystems are in decline. So bumababa. This was in 2012, so medyo matanda na yung data. So... Uh, we don't know in the future, but it's likely that agroecosystems will be in decline in the future. So most likely, kasi changes in uh, in land use. So alam naman natin na nai convert yung mga agroecosystems into other uh, uses for commercial or industrial purposes. So yun yung isa sa mga primary reasons sa decline in the agroecosystems. So when you have a decline in agroecosystems, so you also have not only decline in diversity, but also a decline in productivity. So mas bumababa yung napoproduce nating products. So this is for the whole of Central Luzon. At the provincial level, so throughout the different um, provinces in Central Luzon, there is a marked decline in the areas dedicated for agroecosystem and other agricultural activities. So bumababa lahat throughout the different provinces. Even in Nueva Ecija, which has the largest area dedicated for agroecosystem or, or agricultural activity, there is a marked decline. So pababa ng pababa. So when you have an agroecosystem being converted into other purposes, so hindi niya nasusustain yung ecological um, function niya. Those species which rely on these agroecosystems and the habitats within these agroecosystems either move to a different area or becomes extirpated. So nawawala sila. So medyo bleak yung future ng agroecosystems. More or less similar with the other ecosystems within uh, the Philippines. So there is a marked decline in forest cover. So there's also marked decline in the quality of freshwater habitats. So you could expect that uh, really hindi ganun kaganda yung prospect ng um, ecosystem balance or ecosystem stability sa buong Pilipinas. So kasi lahat ng habitats, whether siya ay natural or man-made habitats, are affected by human activities. So one example of our one observation na related to sa changes in habitat characteristic which has an effect on 
um, species distribution as well as diversity is abundance was this case in um, the university. So in 2018, here is a overhead image getting sa Google Earth. So this area is planted with uh, fruiting trees, primarily tamarind and um, santol. So, and then on the other side of the pond is an area dedicated for mango. So in 2018, we typically capture large number of fruit bats in this area. Uh, dito kasi kami nagsaset up ng traps and nets. So, uh, marami kami laging huli dyan ng fruit bats. Minsan, at least 20 sa isang net. But, by 2019, noong nagsimulang maklear yung um, area planted with fruiting trees, and by 2020, although early part ng 2020, doon nagsimulang mag-decline yung number of bats we captured in this area. So dati nakakakuha kami yung around 20, but by 2019 and 2020, halos wala kami na upuling bats in this area. So the thing here is that bats move from this area to this and vice versa, also taking advantage of available water in the pond. So when you change vegetation cover in an agroecosystem, malaki kagad yung impact niya doon sa vertebrate fauna. Either they move to a new habitat or they have um, or they become extirpated kasi nawawala yung resources nila. So that is just a small change in vegetation cover and habitat characteristic and you can already see within a few years yung effect niya doon sa abundance ng vertebrate fauna. So much more kung i-convert mo yung isang buong agroecosystem into a less diverse habitat, let's say for example subdivisions. To convert them into a subdivision, you would expect that those animals relying on this agroecosystem will move into a different area. So other threats encountered by vertebrate fauna in agroecosystems so of course, you have excessive use of pesticides, which are especially very detrimental to amphibians, especially uh, since very sensitive sila sa introduction of chemicals. Human wildlife conflicts. Uh, in agroecosystems, since these are areas usually associated with human habitation, mas malaki yung chances na encounters between wildlife and human. And in the agroecosystems of Central Luzon, most of the time, this human wildlife conflict in, involves yung usually snakes and human conflict. So it's very common in reports na marami na papatay na snakes and at the same time may mga humans na nakakagat ng cobra and the like. And even species which are not really venomous or dangerous usually pinapatay due to the fact that uh, well they are assumed to be dangerous. Yeah. To be intentional, kagaya ngayon nangyayari sa mga snakes. Or minsan, for example, yung mga birds, usually hinahunt, especially if they uh, feed on the planted crops. It could also be accidental, for example, yung mga roadkills. Since usually, agroecosystems are associated with roads. Marami naman dyan na mayroong roads. So many animals are being killed accidentally. And then, of course, you have the issue of introduced alien invasive species. Not only vertebrate, uh, a vertebrate fauna, but also those invasive plant species. If you have invasive plant species in an area, usually napapababa niya yung um, heterogeneity or diversity ng habitat in an area. So pwede niyang change yung habitat characteristics at the same time they can compete with the native species of plants and animals. So these are the other threats aside from land conversion or habitat uh, change. So what's being done to conserve um, Central Luzon's and Philippines' other agricultural area and their associated agroecosystems? So uh, most of Central Luzon's agricultural lands are not included as conservation priority areas. 
So if you will look at the map, this was from the Philippine Biodiversity Conservation Priorities. So those marked in red and orange and red and gray are conservation areas. So conservation priority areas. But if you will look at the bulk of Central Luzon, where most of the agroecosystems are found, so mapamasin nyo, wala pumasok sa conservation priority areas. The primary reason for this is that this uh, area, these agroecosystems are usually privately owned. So titulado mga lupa. Whereas yung mga conservation priority areas in the PBCPP is actually uh, public land. So those land uh, which the government wants to protect or conserve. But for most of agroecosystems, uh, usually ang privately owned, kaya hindi sila na isasama. And they are also disposable and alienable lands. That means they can be used for other purposes aside from agriculture. Kaya um, walang masyadong issue when it comes to if you want to convert an agroecosystem into a different for a different function. Kasi yung sa kanyang classification. But in the proposed National Land Use and Management Act of the Philippines, so under Section 5, isinasama or isinusulong na isama yung prime agricultural lands for conservation purposes. So when we say prime agricultural lands, these are lands uh, which are used for production at the same time as those area which needs conservation. So kasama yung mga habitat types na associated with your agroecosystem. So those areas which may be affected by um, climate change and other anthropogenic activities. So there is a move to protect agricultural lands and agroecosystems from land conversion. So yun yung pinaka idea with the National Land Use Management Act of the Philippines. So that is a step forward when it comes to protecting our agroecosystems the inclusion of agricultural lands for protection, primarily preventing their conversion into other purposes. Okay, so conclusion, last part of my presentation. So basically summary, so agroecosystems are home to a wide array of vertebrate fauna. Uh, definitely hindi siya kasing diverse ng um, forests hindi siya kasing diverse na um, let's say marine habitats or na mangrove ecosystem. In, when it comes to endemism, hindi ganon karami endemic species, but definitely agroecosystems are home to a wide array of vertebrate fauna, which are either resident or transitional residents of these habitat types. So species composition shows seasonal and spatial variation. So some species may only be present during the wet season or the dry season. Some species take advantage of whatever um, vegetation or structure there is in an agroecosystem. And definitely agroecosystems are easily affected by human activities. Compared with forest ecosystems, Mas malaki yung changes experienced by agroecosystems since they are readily accessible and they are of immediate significance when it comes to productivity and as well as economic activities. Kaya mas madali siyang apektuhan o maapektuhan ng human activities. So for recommendations, uh, definitely there's a need for additional study. Of course, ang focus ng... Philippines, especially when it comes to biodiversity, is understanding the biodiversity of the pristine or the primary natural habitats. But agroecosystem also merits study. So there is limited data on species diversity available for other ecosyst agroecosystems throughout Central Luzon. So I was actually looking for publications online related to biodiversity studies conducted in other agroecosystems throughout the zone. For example, sa Bulacan, uh, Pampanga, Tarlac. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot find any online um, data 
on the species diversity in other agroecosystems. So this is really important because um, if you want to make distribution maps, so maganda sana alam natin kung saan yung distribution ng species. Uh, I'm not sure kung merong available sa mga uh, university libraries, but it would be nice kung merong uh, mas ac easy access to the species list of fauna in the agroecosystems throughout Central Luzon. So invertebrate fauna assessments are also needed. Kasi what I presented is only about the vertebrate fauna. So definitely mas marami pagdating sa invertebrate fauna. And then assessment of impact of human activities on agroecosystem. So how does human activities affect diversity and the structure of an agroecosystem? Um, actually studying agroecosystems is quite easy when it comparison to studying, for example, a forest. Because agroecosystems are readily accessible. Uh, hindi siya ganun ka, uh, kahirap survey So wala masyadong puno, hindi ka gaya sa forest. So uh, this is a viable option for those who want to start studying biodiversity. So kumbaga para siyang practice ground for studying uh, biodiversity if you want to go into biodiversity surveys and the like studies. So here are just some of the recommendations when it comes to studying Central Luzon and other agroecosystems throughout the Philippines. So that ends my presentation. I hope you, uh, I was able to uh, provide additional information and knowledge to the to our participants. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, thank you, uh, Paul, for that uh, presentation, and uh, I hope maraming mga tanong yung ating mga participants uh, in a later uh, while. And uh, habang nag-iisip kayo ng mga questions, as promised, uh, we will have a short quiz. Uh, questions are given by by Paul, and uh, nakita nyo po kanina do sa chat box. Um, you could go to slido.com and then put in the the code there. Let me just uh, share my screen. Habang hinihintay po natin yung mag-log in ang ating mga quiz contestants. Um, Paul, maybe I could ask a few questions. How have you considered you know, studying or probably baka meron kayong uh, results already on, um, on the diversity of uh, agroecosystems? But you know, you're, fring you're focusing more on the fringes. No? Kasi... Mm -hmm. Possibly, baka ang inaral nyo is uh, baka right in uh, right uh, smack in, in ano at the middle of a rice field ganyan. Pero meron na bang studies there in um, in uh, Central Luzon na probably within the outskirts of an agroecosystem and then malapit na yung mga um, forested areas. Um, okay, in the case kasi ng uh, Central Luzon. The nearest usually na forested areas would be in Bulacan, mm -hmm. parte ng Sierra Madre, and in the Carabalo, which is in the northern, um, northern Nueva Ecija. Uh, in the case of the Carabalo Mountain Ridge, which is yung pinakamalapit sa uh, university, hindi na siya masyadong planted with rice, but more on vegetables. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, our focus in this study was on areas planted with rice. So ideally, nga sana meron yung areas planted with vegetable adjacent to forested habitats. Oh, I see. Okay. So ganun, sa, ganun sana. But uh, in the, in, this is, since this is the first, um, what you call this, um, thorough survey of vertebrate fauna in Central Luzon. So we focus in area na readily uh, accessible. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah. And then, um, how about, meron na ba kayong study measuring the diversity of these um, organisms, no? yung mga vertebrate fauna? Um, you've talked about, you know, seasonal variation, like yung ating uh, dry season and the wet, wet season. season. But meron ba tayong uh, a little bit more specific, especially um, uh, ang ating variable eye cropping pattern? Like, uh, 
especially uh, of course during planting ng rice di ba meron mm, tayong tinatawag yeah. na parang follow period ah, may follow period mm-hmm. so very interesting din yun kasi nawala yung possibly yung Probably. yung main main habitat mo which is pra- pa- rice di ba and then there's probably one month or three weeks na nawala yung rice diyan so any any opinion on that yeah actually maganda nga sana yung uh, i saw one study na kinundak sa International Rice Research Institute sa Iri mm-hmm. but unfortunately hindi pa namin siya nagawa dito sa CLSU yung seasonal variation pag uh, ng species composition a uh, composition in line with the planting uh, season so yun mm-hmm. yung sana yung maganda uh, yes, yes. Oh. medyo mahirap kasi siyang i-conduct especially kung uh, you can only conduct for a certain period eh, kasi nga um, o oh, saglit ito, lang yun eh no? saglit lang yun eh tapos na yun natatiming pa na meron kang other duties so mahirap siya i-monitor ng actual mm-hmm. so uh, yun sana yung magandang ring gawing study especially when it comes to seasonal variation sa bird composition kasi oh, bago bago oh, yun oh. eh dun sa study in iri so this particular bird species found only during this fallow season then uh, during this maturing season so maganda sana yung magawa rin yun. So uh, uh, that's a recommendation actually na pwedeng gawin ng mga undergraduate student. At least in the case of Central Luzon. Kasi wala pa ako nakitang study doing that kind of um, survey. Uh, especially yung mga ground birds. no uh, mm. Hindi natin alam kung nadun pa sila or pwedeng... Oh. May, mayroon pa nga natitira because they're foraging on yung on mga ground. on the ground. Diba? But... but yun nga lang eh kasi dal open na siya possibly um hindi na rin sila magsi-stay there no and, uh, very interesting na topic din yun so, and uh, yung mga water birds kapag mataas na yung um, rice medyo mahirap na silang i-survey eh mm-hmm. usually so, nga yung dito sa iri what i've noticed is that kapag uh, maraming migratory birds ang dumadating um uh, just at the beginning of the farrowing no kapag hmm. nagsa-start na silang magtil ng ng lupa kasi so, lupa. nabubungkal na yung soil so nagagalaw yung uh, rice fields and then it exposes yung mga possible na mga hmm. pwedeng makain ng mga ng mga ibon no pero hmm. kapag uh, let's say naglagay na sila ng ng water nagkaroon na sila ng alternative wet and drying uh, madalas nawawala din sila or umuunti pero of course hindi naman ako ornithologist uh, I wouldn't dare to uh, give my my conclusion on that uh, in the case of CLS so kasi meron kaming mga permanent fund doon sa area mm-hmm. ng College of Fisheries so ang tendency din ng ibang mga migratory bird they move to that area kasi permanent yung water so doon naman sa mga area na intermittent yung water for example yung mga natutuyo usually nawawala sila nilipat sila doon sa uh, mas permanent yung water. Like for example, yung mga egrets and herons. Mm-hmm. So yun, magkaiba sila ng spatial distribution. Okay. So uh, siguro yung ibang questions ko, i- itatanong ko na later. And then let's start the quiz. We have around, probably around 30 participants right now. And um, I'll just give the first question. So, first question is, agrobiodiversity is composed of plant diversity. Uh, I hope, uh, well, yung slido, it's taking longer than expected. Probably because of the internet fluctuations. But uh, let's see. Uh, it's composed of plant diversity and blank. So, you have 15 seconds. All right. And uh, 84% of you answered A, associated uh, diversity. Let's see the answer. And a lot of you were correct. Next question. Of the six species of invasive frogs in the Philippines, how many were recorded uh, at CLSU? So the options are three, four, five, and six. Okay. And uh, tie on three and six. Let's see which is the correct answer. And the answer is actually four. Can you elucidate, Paul? Ano yung apat uh, na ito? Those four are the common toad, yung Rhinella marina. Your mm-hmm. Malaysian uh, painted or Asian painted frog, which is your Kalula. The green tree frog, which is Hylarana eretria. And the other one is your Hoplobatracus or your Chinese bullfrog. Okay, so... Uh, so uh, 
I think the the key word here is invasive frogs, all right? Invasive frogs. Okay. So next question: Which of the vertebrate uh, group recorded in the studies uh, presented by Paul have the highest percentage of endemic species? Uh, amphibians, reptiles, birds, or the mammals? Okay. And it's a tie between amphibians and birds. Actually, sorry, it's reptiles po <laughs> ang uh, maraming endemic species of the vertebrate groups. No? At least close na. Next question. CLSU was once home to what species of endemic uh, Philippine mammals? So is it the Tarsier Tamara, the Philippine deer, or the Philippine Tree squirrel. I think marami naman makakuha na ito. <laughs> Dadalawa lang naman sila, di ba? Okay. So, so 73% ang Philippine deer. First, ang tamaraw. Hindi talaga siya makikita because uh, it's endemic to Mindoro. And the uh, Philippine darsier is mostly found in uh, Bohol and uh, Dinagat in some parts of Mindanao. And I don't know where you Philippine tree squirrel, but probably I think Palawan. it's also in, in Mindanao. Palawan. 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 Mm-hmm. All right. So uh, Philippine deer ang, ang answer dyan. And uh, the la- I think this is the last question based on the data from the Philipp- PSA or the Philippine Statistics, Statistics Authority. What is the trend in agricultural land area in Central Luzon uh, for the past uh, 50 years? So is it stable, unstable? Increasing or decreasing? So 55% answer decreasing and I guess that's the right answer. So let's see the leaderboard. Tignan natin kung sinong nakakuha. PJ got a four out of four out of the five questions and answering it in a total of uh, 43 seconds. So the hardest question, <laughs> ang marami nagkamali, is yung... Uh, Six species of in, uh, out of yung six uh, yung invasive frogs uh, that were recorded from Central Luzon. So, marami salamat, congratulations, PJ, for you no know, uh, topping our our quiz. Salamat. So we we go straight ahead to our um, our open forum. Let me just unshare my screen. Just put your questions in the chat box. We'll be waiting for uh, more questions from our audiences. So, uh, ang ating unang-unang question comes from Patrick Hernandez. And uh, he, he asks, what could be the reason why there are uh, abundant or probably there's a certain number of endemic species of reptiles in the agro-ecosystems, uh, particularly in Celestial, uh, given that you know, agro-ecosystems are highly disturbed. So, Thank you, Patrick. Advice ko yan eh. <laughs> okay, may extra point ka na, Patrick. Hindi, <laughs> graduate na yan eh. Ah, graduate ka na. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, for the reptiles, if you will notice, most of them are actually um, snakes. Most of the endemic species of snake of the reptiles are snakes. So these snakes are usually talaga associated with um, agro-ecosystems. Aside from, they're also found in forested habitats. So these endemic species are more or less able to adapt and take advantage of the resources within agro-ecosystem. So usually talaga nakikita sila. Uh, although yung Baranos marmoratus, which is yung common monitor lizard, uh, as you can see within the data, wala na siya kasi being a large reptile, madali siyang mahuli, mahan. Mm-hmm. Di kagaya ng mga snakes that they are more adaptable and they can usually evade human uh, interference. Usually, kasi minsan, minsan nahuli naman sila. So, highly adaptable kasi itong mga endemic reptiles na ito. Unlike your frogs, which are really sensitive to um, um, habitat degradation, so yung mga reptiles, they are more or, more or less kaya nila mag-adapt dun sa habitat. So, I, get, I hope that answered the question. Okay. Thank you. So, siguro related to that, uh... You've mentioned that the frogs are very particularly um, sensitive because of the uh, climate, no? Tsaka yung availability of water. Pero uh, meron din bang 
um, significant impact yung uh, to the population and diversity of the reptiles in CLSU or in Central Luzon. Um, if we were to consider, uh, you know, human feeding on on reptiles, no. Uh, hindi ko alam kung uso ang kinakain ng ahas but in Pampanga I think uh, uh, may mga delicacies that are focusing on on reptiles no so mm-hmm. I don't know about uh, there in Central Luzon okay uh, in Central Luzon usually ang um, madalas talagang target for human consumption would be yung mga amphibians uh, mm-hmm. specifically yung mga field, uh, Chinese bullfrog So common siya for uh, delicacy, especially for example nga sa Pampanga. Although there are reports also na meron din yung mga monitor lizard na ginagawang exotic uh, food. Saka yung mga python, articulated python. Although since these are protected species, so na-minimize yung consumption on these reptiles. So ang focus now is on the consumption of those species na common like yung, um, yung Chinese bullfrog. As mm-hmm. well as yung in-export natin ngayon na invasive na Chinese social turtle. So sa Pampanga, I think hinuhuli siya. Although hindi siya delicacy, ha, uh, usually hinuhuli siya then uh, in-export sa China. So ah. yung ah. sa human consumption. Okay, okay. Pwede rin siguro natin isama dito yung impact nung, uh, ngayon di ba, uh, sa, sa uh, biology. Di ba, usually ginagamit natin yung mga frogs for dissection. Uh-uh. So pwede natin yung... Uh, pag-aralan yung impact nito. Uh, sabi nga nila dun sa, minsan nakikita ko na nakapahinga daw yung mga frogs kasi hindi na dinadaisek ng mga bio students. Kasi nga, naka-online, naka-online classes. Online. <laughs> Magkano ba pa? <laughs> ang palaka dati, ang palaka dati kasi actually nagiging business, big business yan dito sa Central Luzon eh. Uh, there are instances na umaabot ng, for the farmers ha, gustong gusto nilang nanguhuli nito kasi Uh, umaabot na 140 per kilo yung per kilo ah. mm-hmm. so uh, yung impact niya especially those sa mga frogs na edible usually bumababa may times nga sa department during the time na laboratory class pa kukunti yung mga Chinese bullfrog na nauhuli there are instances na ang ginagamit ng student ay yung toad yung common toad kasi kukunti daw yung huli ng Chinese bullfrog So, hindi ko alam kung kinukonsume o dahil talaga ko bonti lang siya. <laughs> Pwede. O, oh, hindi siguro na taon din sa sa you know, dry season. Naalala ko lang well when I was in the college, yung yung palaka na ginagamit namin sa Bio One, ay, ay, parang limang piso eh. Plus just five pesos noong time na yun. <laughs> I, I really don't know kung siguro in a, uh, past years kung magkano siya kung binibili siya for the laboratory purposes parang here at last PLB. time yata nung merong laboratory classes pa parang 50 pesos kapag off season <laughs> talaga oh. mahal laki pa na ng kaya, inflation na pati doon na kaya usually itong mga frog na to gustong gusto rin ng mga farmers na nandun sa habitat kasi additional source of food and income yeah. Okay, nice. Okay. Uh, okay, we have a question from Emmanuel Gandalera and uh, he asked, uh, based on your experience, is there a common trend on the abundance of vertebrate uh, fauna between the agroecosystem and the wild considering human caused uh, dis- disturbances? Uh, I think depende dun sa ano. Uh, if you are comparing, for example, yung abundance ng... Um, at vertebrate fauna sa agroecosystem and the abundance of vertebrate fauna in a forest. Uh, depende doon sa kung anong vertebrate group. Uh, usually, sa forest, uh, mas mataas ang abundance usually dyan ng mga amphibians and reptiles. But for agroecosystem, medyo mababa yung abundance ng uh, endemic species of amphibians and reptiles. But for the birds, for example, More or less, mas marami kang madaling observe sa agro-ecosystem. Kasi mas open yung habitat eh. So mas madali mo makita kung gano'ng ka-abundant yung species. Whereas for the forested areas na medyo dense yung vegetation, medyo mas mahirap i-assess yung abundance ng species. But for an agro-ecosystem which is very open, madaling i-assess yung abundance eh. Mm-hmm. So it's a matter of uh, being able to properly assess yung abundance. But if you will also consider yung threats, kung gaano karami yung uh, kung ano yung mga threats na na kaka 
uh, influence dun sa diversity and abundance ng species, mas mababa talaga yung sa agroecosystem. Kasi mas madali silang maapektuhan ng uh, human activities. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir, Herman. Thank you, Emmanuel. And uh, our, next quest, our next question comes from Hans Lee uh, Rodriguez and he asks, um, he, uh, he's kind of concerned with the research gap, no? Uh, because both have more than 10 years, both the diversity and uh, on the distribution based on your studies. And and of course, uh, sa land area for agriculture from the PSA. So, um, ano po daw ang maaaring uh, effect nito sa research on uh, related topics? So, probably you could just give your uh, limitations as well as uh, possible um you know mitigation for you to to answer some of the pressing questions that uh, your research uh, would like to answer uh, yes um ang laki nga nung gap kung ma-observe niyo may mga 10 years 20 year gap dun sa species listing so within those 10 to 20 year gap hindi natin alam kung meron ba na dagdag or meron na walang species or kung kailan na introduce tong gantong species so, ang laking, malaki nga siya ang gap, uh, especially if we want to really see trends in changes in species composition and abundance. So, at the same time, ganun din yung pagdating sa data natin sa agricultural area. Yung pagbaba niya, ang laki ng gap. So, hindi natin nakikita in real time, more or less in real time, yung changes in species mm -hmm. composition and how the changes in land area influence or affect species composition and abundance. So, uh, magiging limitation siya kasi uh, let's say, hindi mo alam kung ano talaga yung wala kang baseline information, for example. Kasi ang, ang, ang laki nga ng gap mo eh. So, ang laking impact nito is if you really want to see your trends throughout the years. So, maganda nga ngayon, mayroong exhaustive survey 2019. So, pwede siyang maging baseline in the near, in the future. So, alin doon sa recorded species in 2018-2019 yung nadagdag yung nawala. So, at least meron ka ng baseline information na magagalit. And I hope sana ma every year makontinue yan or probably yeah, every, eh. maski every two years makontinue yung um, surveys nyo. It could be part of, um, you know, some of the requirements of your students, not, not necessarily an exhaustive survey that yes, is yes. being led by a project leader or a funded research. Actually, uh, ina-incorporate siya sa, ano, sa coursework ng animal taxonomy as well as in systematics. Natigil hmm. lang siya nitong nagkaroon niya ng ano eh, ng restrictions. So fortunately nakakuha kami before the restrictions. So so 2019, then 2020, 2021 na ngayon. So hopefully by next year makapag-gather uli ng data to see kung uh, maganda nga actually makita yun eh kasi nawalan ng human activities doon sa mismong yes, yes. Campus. Uh... Medyo mababa yung human activities. So ano yung naging impact nung reduction ng human activities doon sa abundance ng mga vertebrate fauna doon sa agroecosystem within the campus. So pwede sana mag -research. So hopefully by next year makapag-conduct na ulit. Yeah, especially kung um, there would be, you know, um, good protocols mm. ba? or at least uh, at, at CLSU is uh, meron kayo may implement na uh, guidelines on how to conduct yung student research now mm. and still following the, the health protocols. Okay, so from Angela Rojas, and um, she asked us students for future biology, you know, a future, uh, future biology graduates, how much or how badly would you recommend, <laughs> badly <laughs> recommend pursuing the career in biodiversity? Uh, um, I guess maganda yung career sa biodiversity. Um, if you will look at the roster of our experts, uh, field biologists or yung mga experts natin pagdating sa different invertebrate, vertebrate, and plant groups, medyo hindi ganun kadami eh. Hindi karami actually ang nagpa-pursue ng degree or study on biodiversity. Usually, uh, ang gagawin ng bata, magpitesis ng biodiversity and then mag-move into a different field kapag sila ay nakatapot na. Which is fine kasi uh, meron naman tayong kanya-kanyang interest. Um, but yeah, I recommend highly recommend working on biodiversity, especially if you are really interested in knowing or understanding uh, Philippine diversity. 
or kung interested ka talaga sa nature studies or gusto mo maging part of conservation ng ating natural resources. So, maganda siyang career. Definitely. What does it pay? <laughs> ah, big question. <laughs> yun ang ano, clean, clincher, okay. Uh, yun lang yung clincher doon. Kung masipag kang mag-field work. <laughs> I guess, uh, dapat masipag ka mag-fieldwork as well as, you know, um, masipag ka rin mag-propose ng projects yeah. that would uh, generate your 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 funds no so whether kung nasa gobyerno ka or you're yes, in an NGO you have to you know find ways to attract funds because uh, let's face it hindi masyadong let's say hindi masyado attractive you know yung mga ganto yeah. studies because it's uh, it's just like um, uh, what you call this basic you no know? Eh, ang mm-hmm. gusto ko kadalasan ng mga funding agencies especially uh, those from the government ay yung tipong may application na no yung mayroong mm-hmm. return of investment no? investment similar din oh. siguro doon sa ginagawa natin sa mga senior high school students na most of their study ang gusto merong production merong product na i-generate mm-hmm. but for in the case of biodiversity studies kasi uh, hindi siya ty- uh, hindi siya focus on product generation it's more on generation of knowledge So ano yung magde-generate nating knowledge regarding our natural resources. Hindi siya magde-generate usually ng economic impact. Uh, wala siyang product na ipo-produce. Pero yung uh, naintindihan mo na ito yung mga species mo sa lugar and ito yung kanilang function mo sa lugar will be have an implication on conservation. Mm-hmm. And if you conserve these natural resources, definitely meron siyang impact sa uh, economic uh, prosperity ng bansa natin, for example. Okay. Thank you. A uh, question from Ang uh, Angeles De Leon. Um, what measures should you recommend to protect native species uh, from being eradicated or extirpated uh, because of the introduction of the invasive ones? Thank you, Ma'am Angel. <laughs> the department chair namin si Ma'am Angel. <laughs> <laughs> Galingan, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, dito sa Philippines, wala pa tayong standard uh, protocol when it comes to Um, invasive species. Wala tayong ginagawa more or less at the national level pagdating sa control ng invasive species. Um, ang ginagawa in other countries would be direct extirpation ng mga invasive species. Let's say for example sa Australia, yung mga common toad, yung Rhinella marina, kinoconvert nila into fertilizer. But in the Philippines, wala tayong ganung protocol. Wala pa tayong uh, program dedicated on how we can eradicate uh, invasive species. But what we can do is, for example, um, although hindi masyadong gusto ng mga bata yung pinopropose na pwede yung Rhinella marina gamitin as a specimen para sa dissection. Instead of buying the, let's say for example, the endemic Luzon field frog, use the introduced um, Chinese bullfrog and the introduced uh, common toad. Although hindi siya masyadong attractive sa mga bata kasi takot silang hawakan yung common toad. Ang eh. <laughs> eh. uh, It can be done. Um, you can utilize these invasive species while at the same time eradicating them. Um, ganito rin yung ginagawa doon sa invasive na soft shell turtles. So instead of um, just killing this animal, so pinropose siya as an economic activity. So binibenta ngayon, ina-export ngayon sa China which is very attractive dun sa mga um, owners ng mga fish fund na naapektuhan nga nito mga invasive species na to. So we can find alternative use for this uh, introduced invasive species. Then at the same time, although hindi pa rin siya ganun ka mainstream study dito sa Philippines, is yung, although ginagawa ni, yung project palaka ni Norman, ni Norman. yung um, propagation ng mga endemic species. So, pwede rin yun. So, para ma-maintain natin yung mga native species natin. Okay. Thank you. Um, oh, I hope uh, you've sufficiently answered uh, your department chairs <laughs> uh, your quest- in question. So, uh, any more questions from the, uh, from the audience? Uh, before I proceed to the question uh, by of a Christine. Uh, meron akong nais- naisulat dito kanina eh. Um, let me see. Okay. Um, do you have any plans or, any, or, or are there any other uh, 
probably related studies already being done or have been done. Um, because prob I would assume that you focus on yung agro ecosystem that uh, is based on on rice, right? Mm -hmm. But um, any chance that you will be working later on on agro ecosystems that uh, feature other uh, mono monocultured crops like corn? Yes. Uh, I, hindi ko lang alam kung may corn. May corn ba sa CLSU? Uh, wala sa CLSU pero yung sa Tarlac doon. Corn. Okay. So, yes. Um, ideally, sana makapagkunta kasi definitely you will have differences in species composition between the two crops. Kasi iba yung structure ng corn agro ecosystem with the structure of the rice field ecosystem. So, um, I'm not really sure kung meron na study conducted by other universities within Central Luzon on their agroecosystems, but it would be a really good avenue of research. Yung um, vertebrate fauna or the different agroecosystems. Not also, only corn, kasi meron din kami sugar cane, mm -hmm. in pampanga, then in vegetable uh, agroecosystem in uh, northern Nueva Ecija. Okay. So very, and, very diverse kasi yung tinatanim. So maganda nga sana mapag-aralan. Yes. And then possibly siguro you could uh, you know, make uh, things more interesting by like uh, you know, focusing on for example, yung especially for rice and corn. Uh, for example, itong fields na ito is um, GMO mm -hmm. and this is RD open pollinated. Uh, mm -hmm. Kasi usually I, I think mas madalas is yung arthropods kasi eh, yung assemblage mm -hmm. ng arthropods for uh, determining yung impact ng ng uh, ng genetic material no GMO related the uh, products no uh, on arthropods no para makalusot siya sa I think biosafety or okay. I, I, I forgot pero I think it's a worthy worthy topic then to explore no yes. uh, anong effect niya for the vertebrate fauna actually parang yung um, uh, hindi pa kasi ganun din karami yung mga agricultural lands na planted with GMO dito sa uh, Central Luzon, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. hindi pa siya ganun ka, uh, hindi ka gaya siguro sa IRI na meron silang mga area planted talaga with uh, GMO and then those which are more or less traditional variety of, let's say, rice. Mm -hmm. Sa Central Luzon kasi yata more or less mga traditional or yung mga typical na rice varieties pa rin yung time. Okay, sige. So, um, sige, last question siguro from from our audience, from Christine Grace Waing, and uh, what could you recommend to CLSU regarding biodiversity conservation, uh, especially those which are found in the agroecosystems uh, there at CLSU? Okay, thank you, Ma'am Kitim. Uh, of course, mainam sana na conserve na yung what, kung ano man yung meron dun sa area, because these are, ito na yung nakasanayan ng mga species na nandun. So what is important is to conserve what is the those remaining habitats. And of course, hindi naman mawawala kasi talaga na merong magaganap na development. So uh, what can be done is, if sample, if you remove trees from one area, you look for another area na dapat taniman ng trees. So para more or less maintain the vegetation cover at saka, uh, yun, hindi niya na hamper yung spatial distribution ng species. Nandang pa rin yung resources. Kung baka, in-adjust in mo lang. So, uh, kasi hindi nga talaga may iwasan for development purposes. So, yung pag maintain talaga ng habitat is yung primary way of we can conserve this endemic native species na meron sa mga agro-ecosystem. So, pag maintain ng habitat. And then, of course, pwede na rin natin isama dyan yung um, information campaign Let's say, for example, kasi sa Central Luzon nga, yung common dyan yung uh, human-wildlife conflict. Yung mga snakes, usually pinapatay, basta makita, regardless kung anong species. So, mainam din na ma-inform yung public na, okay, these are animals na meron sa agroecosystem, and these are the roles and functions, and then this is what you need to do when you have encountered this species. So, education is really important. Okay, thank you very much. Uh... Um, Tin for that uh, question and maraming salamat uh, Paul for um, you know presenting your uh, studies results and uh, engaging with our audience. Uh, so before we stop our program, let me present this uh, certificate of recognition and the Museum of Natural History, Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research and Extension here at UP, the Spanios awards this certificate of recognition to Mr. Paul Henrik Gohokruz.
for serving as a re resource person during our 2021 MH Biodiversity Seminar entitled Hidden Diversity, the Vertebrate Fauna of a Highly Variable and Ever-Changing Landscape, held today, July 21, from 10 to 11.30-ish a.m. PST via Zoom, and in witness whereof, the signature of our director, Dr. Marian P. De Leon, is hereby affixed. So congratulations, Paul, and thank, thank you. you very much for accepting our invitation. Thank you. And uh, lastly, please uh, check uh, our uh, social media accounts, Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, and Instagram. Just look for the handle UPLB Museum. If you have questions, you could write us at mnh.uplb at up.edu.ph. Check out our um, Wikipedia article. And uh, we have an entry at uh, Trip. Trip Advisor, UPLB Museum of Natural History. By next week, uh, July 28, we have our MNH uh, Quincentennial Commemoration uh, special webinar. Uh, the topic would be microbes uh, in our in Filipino cuisine. Then and now, it will be presented by Dr. Noel G. Sabino uh, from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. July 28th, and we will be announcing the link to the registration page possibly by tomorrow or Friday. So um, keep in touch with us with, through Facebook and then uh, be updated with us. Okay. So let's have our lunch. Uh, Paul, maraming salamat. And to all, our, to all our audiences, thank you for continually supporting us and we look forward to seeing you uh, next week. So with that, Maraming salamat po. Thank you po. Maraming salamat po.